Hello everyone, welcome back to my studio. Today's video is a little bit different. It's gonna be a long chatty study session. I wanted to share an authentic study session experience with you. So going from the ink value studies to the color concept studies to the final piece. And along the way, I'll just be chatting about what I'm doing, but also other random stuff. Wolfie's gonna join us for part of it. Uh, it's just, it's a casual session. So throw this video on up in the background if you're working on something, let me know what you're working on. It's just been so cold and wintry <laughs> that I've been doing a lot of these indoor study sessions and I think it's good to share this type of experience once in a while. This is a very important part of my learning process so hopefully you learn something from it, but also we'll just, I'll keep you company while you're working on something. Lately, I've been having lots of fun with my markers and pens, so doing teeny tiny little compositions, planning for future paintings. Um, also just doodling, like not, sometimes I just doodle without any intention of painting it again or, however, whenever I look back at these, I think about how this would look in color and I really wanna paint it. <laughs> uh, so I thought, I'm in like a forest mood lately and I've been just playing with different little compositions. I especially like big twisty roots and knots and I don't know, I just really like these big thick trees. So I'm going to draw one of these a little bit bigger and play with a slightly different composition and then paint it because I want to play with some new color combinations as well. I'm thinking about, you know, I want to expand my knowledge of color. I don't want to only use the same primaries forever. <laughs> so, you know, something a little bit different for me might be primary magenta is like my go-to mixing pink or red, but instead of, you know, blue or lemon yellow, like I would normally do, I would maybe use Viridian, which is like a phthalo green and a really deep yellow. This is actually almost like an orange. It's called permanent yellow deep. So expand my understanding of color mixing and playing with new pigment combinations. It teaches me so much, but first I want to play with black and white just to figure out my scene. When I first think about what I want to focus on, I try to remember what it was like to be there. In this case, it was a bright sunny day and we were in an area of the forest that was a little bit darker, but then all of a sudden there were patches of light falling across this really big, thick tree. Uh, and that really captivated me. And there was a lot of moss as well. And the forest floor was more reddish, brown. It was just beautiful color combinations. End of the autumn season. When I do these little sketches, I start with a very light pencil. Sometimes it's not um, blue, like I'll use regular pencil as well, but I often use this blue pencil because it's really light and it kind of just disappears behind the ink. It doesn't distract me once I start adding the ink. And I like that. But I'll also just do full drawings with the blue. Like there's one back here somewhere. Like this one. I just really like blue lead. <laughs> but yeah, in this case, it's specifically because I'm going to be adding ink on top and it'll just vanish in the distance. It'll disappear. 
so I ordered something from Jackson's Art and these pigment fine liners came with it for free as just like, I don't know, a gift promotion type thing, it, which was interesting because for so long, like years, I think, at least over a year, I was not into f these felt tip fine liners because they didn't work great on my watercolor paper. All of the ones I had were, they were always drying out and the tips were getting ruined. <laughs> so I kind of just gave up on them. Uh, but then, you know, I got these in the, I got these for free with the thing and I was like, why not? I'll just give them a try. And I was also playing with all these really cheap paper sketchbooks and they're a good combination. So this is the pretty much the only way I like to use them on this kind of paper, cheap, thin, smooth paper. So I have a variety of line widths here. And then I also have my brush pen it just has a big brush tip so I can get really tiny thin lines and really thick lines. Then I also have my Tombow water-based brush markers. Actually they're dual tip so they have a brush tip and a marker, fine marker tip. I have quite a few different shades of gray. We'll start just by outlining my composition. Technically, those four lines are an important part of the composition. <laughs> if I'm just using the fine liners or the brush pen, brush marker, I don't use the grays. Like this is a different style of value study for me. It's, I do this more when I'm thinking about shapes, I guess. But when I'm doing an actual value study for a painting, I like to use the gray markers because it helps me think more about color. I don't know if that sounds strange, but when I see this light gray here versus this really, really light gray here, I think about what color I would use for that versus that. So it's not just about the shape of the tree. It's more about how the light is falling through this landscape. Um, yeah, so today we're going to be using the markers, the gray markers. And I'll typically start with the lightest one and work my way down, which is this one. So this scene... It's um, a backlit scene, or actually I should say sidelit maybe. Um, so I'm gonna leave the background mostly white for now and just add a, a few shady branches. There's some ferns and stuff too. And then I'm going to also use this for any bright patches of light on the tree. I have quite a few references I'm looking at while I do this. And it's a combination of memory and artistic choices and reference. And what's the next? The 75. Some of these trees back here will have a little more shadow, but I want to keep the background pretty bright, I think, and emphasize all the dark, the lovely dark shades on the tree. But the ground will be relatively dark. It's always hard to talk and sketch at the same time because my mind is really, it's like almost like doing a math problem. You are thinking intensely about the problem and how to solve it and you, if you have to access your vocabulary at the same time, that's a little tricky, uh, clearly. But I think Th that's drawing to me is harder while I talk, but when I'm painting, it's a little more intuitive and I'm not, especially with color, I think I'm able to talk a little bit easier. <laughs> it's strange. Right now, it, it, this stage of the drawing is so messy. Like it, it should look like a mess. It's not, nothing is defined. It's just blobs of gray. <laughs> and then we have some really thin uh, 
Got trees back here. I'm almost outlining them. Um, don't want to emphasize these too much. Just to, I just want to establish some shapes. And shadows underneath the trees. So maybe these ferns will be a little darker, which will help define the bottoms of the trees with some light, light on them. I've done quite a few scenes like this. All right, do I want to make the ground? I think I'm gonna make the ground a little bit lighter than the darkest parts of the tree. So this will be my darkest pen, my darkest value on the ground. I can barely see my drawing now. So I'm not only using that to guide me, I'm also thinking about how it's I'm looking I'm looking at the drawing but I'm also thinking about how it's going to translate to color so I'm making decisions on the spot so I'm not just like following the drawing blindly at this point that was there to start me off I, I want to make lots of patches of light falling across the ground so this part the bottom of that, uh, this area down here, it's gonna be lots of texture happening. That's why I'm doing lots of little marks. Otherwise, um, but the tree itself is going to be a little more solid, I suppose. Although there is a lot of texture on the tree. But I don't want to fill the entire thing in with darkness. Especially on the left side, there's a little bit of light hitting. Some of the sections. The bottom right of the tree will be darker. And then after all this gray, I come back in with the fine liner with, with the ink and really increase the contrast and start getting into the details. So that's, that's a lot of fun. So I'll, I'll stop with the gray after this point, basically my second or third to darkest value. Then I'll jump into the darks. Maybe I'll use my tiny fine liner to start off. So I'm not going to add this really dark ink to the background. It's just for the tree. And I'm not trying to get anything perfect because ideally I will maybe do a few of these drawings in a session. So maybe I'll take a whole hour and just do a couple of these little compositions. I mean, I already have all, I already have all of these to reference, but the compositions in these is not what I want to use. I'm using these as, these are inspiring me in terms of light coming through the forest, but I want to really now hone in on my layout, my design. You can see I'm not, my lines are very broken. It's almost like I'm making, I'm like plotting out the majority of the shapes before I commit, I guess. I think if I'm really warmed up, I tend to commit a lot sooner and I'll just go for it. I'll do some nice thick lines and dark darks. But since I'm just starting, I'm like mm, easing into it. <laughs> but once I get into the brush pen, then I'm just, then I just go for it. So now I kind of know my, my layout of the main trunk. 
with a thicker marker. I'm going to, um, there's, uh oh, see this one's starting to dry out. It's the thing about these fine liners is, I don't know, I just, I hate the fact that the, when they dry out, it just seems so sudden. And I don't ever stock up on these things, so I don't have backups. So it's just like suddenly, can't use it anymore. As far as I know, they're not refillable, but if they, if anyone has any hacks, let me know. But otherwise I just use my refillable ink pens. I do like these because they're not messy. That's a huge bonus. Um, let's just dive into the brush pen. So I'm going to add a lot of darkness up here, up here. It's like just under the canopy or where a lot of the leaves were. There weren't a lot of remaining leaves, but that's, it was a lot more shadowy at the top. So now I actually like to squint at the page at this point to eliminate some of the the detail and I and it helps me see bigger shadow shapes a little bit easier. So this dark dark will represent my darkest color when I start painting. And that might be ultramarine or purple or deep grayish brown. I'm not quite sure yet. We'll, I'll start to figure that out once I do some color mixing. But I go slow at this stage because I don't want to overdo it. If I, if I, I can't take these marks back. So I might as well just kind of test out a few spots and once I have a good feel for how it's going if it's if it's going well I should say <laughs> then I may you know start to commit to the more solid shapes I'm tempted to add some darker shadows on the ground um, like you know there's going to be leaves and sticks and Maybe I'll just do that in the foreground. I'm, whenever I start picking up the brush pen, it is so easy to overdo it. So I, I try not to go too crazy, but it's fun. <laughs> There's gonna be some, I think at least I can see the twistiness of the tree, like this will really help me when it comes to painting. I can see this twist here, this one, you know, it, figuring out how I want to emphasize those shapes is probably the most important thing. And the shadows. Now I can also come back with maybe one shade darker here and there. And if I need to, increase that darkness anywhere or maybe I think this is a cooler gray than what I've already been using can't remember I think a couple of my gray markers are like cooler gray rather than warm gray maybe a couple leaves Doing this kind of thing is really great as a warm up because it's like low pressure. It, drawing to me is a really great way to connect with, work on your eye hand eye coordination and just like warm up your brain, I guess, thinking about all these different things. 
the shadows under all these bushes might need to be a little darker, but I'll play with that, I think, once we get to the color. Now, let's do one more with a slightly different composition. I think this one may be a little bit less twisty, but show more of the, um, the branch, the trunk sections branching out. I mean, basically this giant tree, when you walked around it, some angles, it looked really twisty and then other angles, not so much, but there were almost like three full grown trees coming out of it. Almost look, it almost looks like an octopus. <laughs> it's kind of cool. I love drawing trees as if they're alive, as in they're about to stand up and walk around or, you know, just get up and do something. We'll see. Maybe patches of light coming more at the viewer. Long shadows. I just love backlit forest scenes because you can really play with those shadows. This one, which would mean there wouldn't be patches of bright light on this side of the tree. They would be a, only on the back edge. And maybe like a rim light almost. You can always take something you like from one of the compositions and combine it with one, something I like here with this, you know, that's what I do a lot. Sometimes I don't do all of these stages of gray. I think as I get more warmed up and more bold, I skip a few steps. Maybe I'll just go like straight to the darker ones. In this case, I guess it just depends on the mood and the feeling. I am trying to keep them relatively light. I want it to feel like a sunny forest. I don't want it to be super dark and scary, you know, M dark, moody, rainy forest would be much different, different feeling. These trees might be more silhouetted back here. If the sun is kind of coming from that direction, we'll see. Um, let's actually jump straight into the brush pen. Because I love the brush pen, how you can just press so firmly down and get a huge brush stroke and also all that dry brush effect. I mean, that's obviously something, if you watch my gouache videos, you know I am a bit obsessed with getting those dry brush textures. So... dry brush with an ink pen like this. I mean, because it's so dramatic and I 
high contrast. I really love it. And then you get these super fine lines, delicate lines. It's just a lot of fun. So the idea here is I'm using I'm already thinking about color as usual. What will I use for this dark darks? Maybe it'll be a deep mossy green or cool green. There are lots of twisty roots down here. And now I will think about some more mid-tones. Oh, I just realized I never outlined my box. See, that was throwing me off a little. I was drawing to the edge of, I was filling in to the edge of my drawing, but all that white space, it was, I don't know, it was making me think I had more space than I did, which made me, I think that changes how I see the overall composition. So I guess that's my first tip when doing these little ink drawings is to really know the extent of your paper or because I'm going to be using sort of a horizontal composition I really need to think about that as I go so I think, oh, pff, I just drew off the edge there. It's okay. I'm gonna have some rim light on the tree. I think that really helps making, keeping those a little bit lighter. But back here, it's a little more shadowy. And then some highlights on the left edges of those. Again, the ground is going to be lots of leaves and debris and stuff, so little shadows might actually help to define some leaves back here a little bit more because having, if I want this edge of the tree to feel a little bit lighter, I can add some darker leaves next to it and it helps to find that edge. It doesn't have to be really dark, just a few shades darker. Let's see. I don't know which one I want to paint. I want to paint both of them. I think I will paint both of them, but for now, Wolfie, which one do you want me to paint? Bottom one. Bottom one? Yep. Why? Because three branches are more interesting than two. Well, there's... This one's all twisted. So is that one. Yeah. Okay. Well, Wolfie declares this one is more interesting. <laughs> so... ¿Por qué es más interesante? Si. <laughs> uh, we are learning Spanish. Wolfie is way better than me and way ahead of me. I am... Uh, no. Yeah. No. <laughs> you started... He started learning it, like, last year. Yeah, but I, I like, completely stopped. And then you decided that you were going to pick up learning, and 
I got excited and and joined in again. Yeah. But like, I, it's not that I'm way ahead of you. It's that like, well, you are. When I'm watching <laughs> things like Narcos, I'm trying to take in like the words and try to work out what you know with, with the subtitles, which word is which. Yeah. Well, now I do that now that I started learning it, but. I think I'm going to make the tree a little smaller within the frame so I have more room to play with like shadows on the ground. Uh, anyway, yeah. I have I still I've... I still want you to make the the like or or do the tree from um Fern Gully. Not the not the main tree that they all live in, but like the evil looking tree. Oh. There's there are a lot of movies with really cool trees that I would like to paint. <laughs> Wow, I made the bottom of this one a little bit different, but... Yeah, that tree. Oh, yeah. I have drawn that before. Yeah, I think I remember. I drew it. It's in my big blue sketch. I think it's downstairs. But I've painted a lot of twisty trees over the years, and I think that may have been the early inspiration. Have you seen this movie? <laughs> what? Fern Gully. Obviously. You have, okay. A million times okay. when I was a kid. Uh, good. <laughs> So where is this tree? In my head. Oh, it's not from one of like our forest. Oh somewhere. no, yeah, it is. It's in. It's near Loch Nabo. It's um, the. What on the trail around it? Yeah, when you go all the way around, you pass by a few. Here, I'll show you the reference. Okay. Okay. And it's huge. There's like literally three trees growing out of it. It's like oh, massive. Maybe, yeah, maybe do remember it actually. I say I say branches. What would that be? Three trunks or or yeah, br two. trunks. Yeah. <laughs> they're basically they're 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 trees. Yeah, trees that wrap Huge around trees. each other and joined. Yeah, so. matrimony. <laughs> Besides learning Spanish together, we have been playing. Well, first we both played through Hogwarts Legacy. Yeah, we, we each did two houses. I did Ravenclaw, and I'm just about to finish Gryffindor. And Wolfie did Slytherin I, and Hufflepuff. I did Hufflepuff first. Yeah, but you get a special uh, but, like scene in each house. Yeah, so you get like you get, each house gets their own sort of special mission, and Hufflepuff was supposedly the best special mission. All right, we're so, switching to painting now. So yeah, the, <laughs> we paused, um, and now I'm ready to go. I decided I'm going to go with permanent yellow deep, quinacridone magenta, viridian, ultramarine, moss green. But mostly these three. These are these are just secondary, and then obviously white. So yeah, with with the houses. <laughs> Back to this. Yeah, uh, you, you obviously as Hufflepuff, you get basically to go to Azkaban, which is the special mission. Mm. And it doesn't change the course of the game or anything. It doesn't really change anything massive, but. Yeah, out of out of each of the special missions, it was the coolest. Getting to go there was was pretty cool, but I think they only did that with Hufflepuff because they wanted more people to choose it. Apparently, uh, they did a, a sort of check on the game, and the most popular house is Slytherin. <laughs> like everybody goes really? for Slytherin. Yeah, everybody goes for Slytherin. Apparently. It'd be. I thought it would be Hufflepuff or. No, it's actually Slytherin, and then it's either it's either Gryffindor or Ravenclaw. I can't remember which one was like second. I think it might be Ravenclaw. Hmm. And Hufflepuff was basically the last, so I th I feel like they put in the coolest mission, on the house that was going to get chosen the least. So we've been playing that. We're pretty much done with that. And then we just started playing Baldur's Gate 3, mm -hmm. which is so complicated, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially compared to... Compared to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it is just a, a more complicated game. It's based on the Dungeons & Dragons mm -hmm. story rule and setup, set. rule set. So that's got a big learning curve. Yeah... But we played uh, Original Sin, Divinity. Divinity, Original Sin. It yeah, was we played same, that. Uh, the same same company that made yeah. it, Larian Studios. And we really enjoyed it. We it did multiplayer really with our friend. 
yeah. online, which was also really fun. Uh, but yeah, it was a long time ago, and we loved it. And we're like, oh, let's just play the new one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's gonna be cool once we figure out the yeah once we get to strategy with it. Like yeah, because it's but I've never done I've never played Dungeons and Dragons. I don't really have that background. So no, me neither. It feels very new and complicated to me. Yeah. So I'm watching a lot of tutorials. Although I feel like tutorials will only teach you so much. Like at some point, it's it's to do with luck because it's literally the roll of a dice. Yeah, part of it is. Um, Last night when I started my own game after you and you and me had played. Uh, so maybe it is a benefit for halflings. <laughs> who yeah, have a lot of yeah, luck. totally. We were we were <laughs> slagging off the halfling race. We were just like, nah, the, the, luck. That's all you get, luck. Why but, would you be that if you could be? A, Cool elf or a demon, and, yeah. You know, but what's but, what's the what's the use of being a demon if you can't roll any any decent dice? Yeah. But now the uh, it, it, because of the whole dice roll thing, when I when I started my own game after you went to bed, uh, I did the brain thing again and I failed again. I died, you know. Oh, the beginning. Yeah, both times <laughs> when I tried to do the brain thing. Uh, I'm a monk. My dice roll fails. I'm a monk, and I have a lot of a potential to get super powerful. But the good thing is I start off with a lot of dexterity, and you need certain things at the beginning. Yeah. But, yeah, we should make a more balanced team once we both level up a couple what times. What are you with again? You druid. Are, yeah, you're a druid. I'm a, I'm a herbalist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a half wood elf monk. <laughs> Which I guess monk is one of the least played characters, so that should is it? Yeah, I thought half orc was. Uh, maybe I don't know, but there's all these videos about oh, monk is so underestimated, and oh right, I, yeah. you know, maybe a, f- a few of them have videos like that, but I think so because I'm sure I I went looking for some videos on a uh, druid builds, and it was like. There was quite a few of the videos were saying that druids heavily underestimated and that it's probably one of the best in the game. Mm. That's what people said about monk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's just if you go looking for it, if you go looking for the thing, then they're gonna say what you want to hear. Yeah, so, yeah. But uh, it's been fun. Yeah, in the yeah. little amount we've played, I just I do want to watch a tutorial about the uh, battles and. Spells and things in the right place. Anyway. I just realized as we've been talking, I've barely paid attention to what I'm doing. I'm just like mixing. Uh, it's like when you... How does it look like you know what you're doing then? Uh, it's like when you're driving and you suddenly realize that you're at your destination. And you're like, how did I get here? Uh, no, <laughs> That's what this no, feels like. No, never happens to me. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> The whole this is just the color concept sketch, you know. It's to work out if these are the colors I want to use, and if so, how am I going to use them? And then I can do a more finished piece. But so this is supposed to be rather quick and loose, and just you know figuring out what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it. I always this part of the pa- the stage of the painting, I guess, is so ugly. That you feel like, oh, I'll never be able to paint this well, you know. But you're always amazing at it. Well, you're biased. What? You're biased. Uh, Yeah, but... (laughs) Yeah. There's lots of moss at the base of the tree. There's, like, some rim light happening on the left. Wolf, Wolfie's gonna go do other things now. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> bye. <laughs> uh, now I'll actually be able to concentrate. Uh, that, is that what it was I was distracting? Uh, probably. Mm. These little color concept sketches are. I actually usually do them a little bit smaller than this. Like I said, they're meant to be quick and just allow you to 
get your idea down. If you paint it too big and focus on too much detail, I think it, in that case, you might as well just paint the thing. So when I do, I try to be conscious of if I'm you know, sitting there fussing with one particular area too much, that's not the point. I need to think about the painting more holistically at this point. And, you know, how is my going to create the light I want to create in the background? How am I going to create these patches of light coming forward? Am I going to use light pink for the highlights on the ground or light yellow? All of that. I guess you could see it as a fact-finding mission at this point. I think one thing that's uh, tricky about this stage of the painting is because it's so messy and ugly, it's hard to stay positive about the results. But the thing is, you could even use this as a warm-up. And if you discover something during this phase that you really love, just make a mental note of it. It's really hard to mix this purple shadowy color I want. I think I need to utilize more grays because right now everything's too colorful. I wanted to start with a colorful base and then come back with more grays on top, but now I'm wondering if maybe I should do a wash of color, bright color, and then paint on top of it with more gray tones. So that bright color might pop through a little bit here and there, might show through a little, but it won't be as difficult to cover as this would be. I don't know if that made sense. Again, it's all, the strategy is a work in progress as I paint. Sometimes I know exactly how I want to paint something and from start to finish it goes really smoothly. I don't have as much fun in those paintings though. <laughs> like I'll, I do prefer to let something be a little more spontaneous along the way, the process. There we go. I like painting with a bit of purple under the bark and then coming back with a dry brush and doing brown on top because that purple will still show through a little. It'll even blend a little with what I'm doing. So it'll still be colorful and you'll get so much variety like really quick. One of the issues now is I didn't really define the base of the tree very well yet. I kind of ignored it until now. So, how about we do that? With some purple shadow. It's um, a little tricky to get the shape of the base of this tree correct because there's so many twists and turns and little little areas of shadow. Like, I think that actually works a little better. Okay, so now we have kind of a base started. Viridian and magenta make a beautiful color, deep color like this. Which I think will be really good for the deep shadows, which I'll do now. And as they get into the light, we'll add a bit more white. because the tree is so mossy. But I want to preserve the warm green for the parts that will have light. Looks like I do need more ultramarine than I thought I would though. 
because I don't want the Viridian to take over. <laughs> I like it, but not that much. It's just too strong. Okay, get in there. Maybe a bit more shadow. Here, oops. I think Viridian and Magenta, that's such a nice shadow combo. Definitely going to remember that one. So we want to have dark shadows falling across the tree to sort of represent bright patches of shadow and sun. Wait, not bright patches of shadow, bright patches of sun. <laughs> I think it's really important to have a very light edge here as this is going to be the like where the sun is catching really bright so I'm almost using pure white it's a little bit greenish it's maybe too green or too white I mean and in the final painting, I think it'll be important to have these back here be a little darker so that the tree well, that's kind of blue. Hmm. Do I want that much blue? No. I just want like a faded green back there, but still darker than the tree. That'll be tricky. I'll have to play with that. Perhaps a ultramarine plus magenta plus yellow. That gives me a brown. And then white makes it more of a grayish brown. More blue. much light green back here. Let's see how it looks if I had a bit of foliage in the background. To really mess it up, make it feel, it's, I still want it to feel lighter back there, but not so open. I think that helps a little. I could use grayer green in the background and that way the foreground will be more colorful in comparison. Um, but I'll keep the really dark darks and the blues for the foreground. Like I said, this Possibly too much pink on the forest floor, but the thing is the reference is quite bright. There's so many bright leaves on the ground But does that mean it should be in the painting? That's the thing. It's like you have to make the choice between a uh, choice of what do you keep from the original inspiration? What do you preserve and what do you change to make a better painting? I think it looks great as a photo, but not as great as a painting. I think it needs to be more subtle. I will say it is, this is really tricky with such different colors. I'm having, I'm struggling to uh, create that, create the colors and the, and 
understand the values of these colors <laughs> compared to usual. I don't know if this shape really makes sense. It's a little too repetitive, so maybe this just becomes one shape. You'll have to let me know if this kind of video is interesting. It's, it's a longer, slower video, but it's exactly, I'm trying to express how I normally work through these issues, not issues, but through, I work, how I work through the phases of the painting and practice and grow as an artist, practice color, practice new color combinations. I can only do so much with this painting. I can only keep touching it so much without turning into a really muddy mess. It already is kind of, but I can at least see what I, I can still see what I learned from it. The only thing is I need to figure out what color I want to use for the forest floor. Highlights. Because I don't want them to be super, super crazy bright. Maybe this like yellowy orange with a lot of white mixed in. Just hints of brightness. Maybe like that. Not streaks, but like how they how it hits leaves or debris on the ground. Kind of works. Yeah, maybe like a tannish gray, uh, yellowish with a bit of white, desaturated. Just so I remember, I'll make notes of the colors I used. I ended up barely using the moss green because I could mix moss green so easily. But it is a nice convenience color if I need a lot of it all of a sudden. It's also a good green color to start with and then you could add blues or yellows into it to change it. I have a piece of spare loose Baohong cold press. I think it's cold press. Yeah. When it's rough, you can really see a lot of texture. Uh, putting the tape on with the words upside down helps me avoid being distracted by them. <laughs> Using watercolor paper will allow me to get a nice, loose, flowy wash to start with, which I love for forest scenes especially, where this one, I could use a little bit of water, but it's, the paper is much thinner and uh, limiting. So yeah, now I can really play with those washes. So what I liked about this composition was that I had a bit more space to play with the base of it. So I want to make sure I do that again. But I need to establish the structure of the tree a little bit better. It's an interesting tree because it has three huge trunks coming out of it. And it almost seems impossible the way that it's standing. So as long as I keep it looking balanced, it'll be good. But it's a little tricky. I'm drawing these a little lines a little darker this time because I don't want to lose them in the paint in the first wash. They'll be important since that was something I struggled with in the concept.
I'm, I'm changing a l the composition a little from the reference so that it just suits. I love playing with big roots and twisted roots and stuff, so I want to emphasize that a little. Maybe some big burls or knots or something. So. It's okay if it shows through a little bit in the end. Probably won't though because it's uh, going to be opaque paint on top. And I do like the background having an angle to it. And there are a few relatively big trees back there, but nothing will, in size wise, will compare to the foreground tree. Gotta be careful with what overlaps with what. I don't want to create any mom any places of like tension in the composition. Okay. I think that's it. I may have like a lo a couple rogue, <laughs> not rogue, but like a couple root knots sticking up here and there. I'm going to keep the background a little more grayish this time instead of bright yellow light because I felt it was a bit too much. I do want yellow here and there. Especially like coming through here. I can already feel a difference in the experience with having this nice watercolor paper. It just allows you to play with those wet washes and it's so enjoyable. I guess I'm always a little biased. I mean, my background was in, I, I found watercolor before I found gouache, so that, I love that spontaneity of watercolor. And I think I enjoy carrying that into the experience of gouache a lot. All right. Got a bit of that started. Now I can start adding more pigment and I think what I learned in the first one is not going quite so pink on the ground. Even though the photo is very pink, it, it's got a lot of vibrant tones in it. It was too much as a painting. So I'm going to hint at it here and there, but mostly keep it subtle. <laughs> there goes the words. It's been a long time since I've done this kind of thing on YouTube. I think I like making tutorials more for gouache rather than watercolor because something I enjoy sharing in the tutorial experience is that I also don't have it all figured out and I'm, I learn and I grow every time I paint and A lot of people seem to think I have it all figured out and it's just not the case. I 
I learn so much every time I paint. I mean, if I think I would be really bored and I would just stop painting if I wasn't learning something and I'd just go do something else. <laughs> okay, don't get too vibrant, keep it subtle. There are a lot of temptations with gouache because it's such vibrant pigment to really go intense, which can also look cool and it's it can be used in its own way, but I really want to learn grays, learn to use them. The power of gray. I'm using the big brush so that I don't focus on too many details this early, especially because I want this background to be so loose and wet and flowy, soft. But I do want to limit my water control as I continue on. So I'm gonna switch to a smaller one. Just a little. This is another reason I like doing the wet wash with a forest background, especially because you can play with that bleed between the trunks and the, the leaves. So they can just kind of fade off. The more the paper dries, obviously, the more it'll become an like you're drawing back here, but there we go. Okay, very soft, still pretty muted colors, which means I'm now able to work into more intense colors in the foreground. And I think I'll use that, I'll use this painting as an opportunity to learn or, you know, play with this juxtaposition of soft, flowy, muted tones and more intense tones in the tree in the focus area and more opacity. Leave all this a little bit uh, transparent because it's pretty transparent right now. And then just see how that feels in comparison to a heavier application of paint here. I haven't done that too much. Is it gonna look too disjointed? I don't know, we'll find out. So the shadows on the forest floor are gonna be like a muted purple. So I'm basically mixing purple and adding a bit of yellow to make it a little bit less intense. But because there's more pigment now and less water, it's gonna be, the edges will be a little harder. I need to use a bigger brush now. Okay. I don't think I'm gonna put music on this video because I just want it to be easy background listening. You can have your own music on while we hang out. Um, not mixing my pigment on my brush 
enough. I'm getting like streaks of color, which I actually like sometimes for some things. Hmm. For the shadow coming off of the tree. Nope, that's green. The shadow coming off of the tree, do I want it to be a little darker? So magenta and viridian is a lovely purple, but it's hard to get the balance. <laughs> it's either too pink or too, there we go. Oh, perfect. And now I can mute it down a little with some yellow. So it's more brownish. There we go. So don't want to lose these roots that I painted in or drew in, I mean. But now the paper's drying a little, so it's actually going to start switching to a dry brush texture as I sweep it on, which is good because it's going to, the forest floor is all rough and there's stuff everywhere, so it's going to give it that natural roughness that it needs. And I think that's it for the first layer of the floor, that is. I think I'll come back maybe later with more stuff on the forest floor, but now I'll do the base of the tree, which there's two things, two ways I like to approach tree trunks. Either I paint the local color, which would be what it looked like in person, trying to avoid any kind of cast shadow or cast light. So brown and green maybe because the trunk is very brownish gray and moss is green. That would be the local color. And then I would paint, I'll let that dry and I would paint the cast light and shadows on top. Or I could just paint all of that right away and come back with even more variety later, which is kind of what I tend to do. So, uh, because that's what I see mostly is I see how the light is bouncing off of things and that's the color I paint first. So there's two approaches and they both work. Um, so maybe I'll start with a grayish bark tone because that's I need more blue. There we go. We're getting there. I'm trying to mix enough so I don't run out right away, but I've already, I think I've run out of my blue. There's a gray. So this is the base color of the tree. And on top of this, I will paint darker shadows. I will paint highlights. Everything on top of this will tell the story of what is happening with light. I'll paint this background one a little more muted, so with a little more white in it that desaturates it and it'll just make it feel a little bit farther away. already run out of my color and it's impossible to mix the same color. It'll always be slightly different. That was pretty close actually. But I'll finish at least one trunk at a... I'll finish this trunk with as much as I can. And then I'll paint this last trunk. It's, you know, at this stage again, it's like you're kind of in that ugly phase where you're like, oh, is this going to work out? <laughs> um, it's not terrible. Sometimes it's much worse at the uh, at this stage, but okay, I need more blue. I keep saying it and I'm not doing it. I need to just do it.
And another one bites the dust. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, the ugly face. It's not I'm not being mean or anything. It's just a, it's legit how it feels when you're getting that first layer or two down and it's just like, oh gosh, what is going on? It's like so messy. Nothing is defined. <laughs> Maybe a bit too much water. Oops. There we go. I used a bit more purple on this side, didn't I? I didn't quite get that gray that I wanted, but it's okay. This side is going to have the higher contrast anyway, so I'll be layering quite a bit there. I'm wondering from a viewer perspective, like how does it, uh, does this approach that I'm doing in this painting feel extremely different to my concept sketch where I was like, felt like I was just fooling in pain everywhere and trying things as I went and just, it, it seemed to me, it feels like a much different process. This feels much more focused. I have more solid plan which is the point, I guess. <laughs> um, but is it noticeable, that difference to you, the viewer? Or is it all the same? Okay, we, I still didn't mix enough. I always forget how thirsty watercolor paper is with, especially with gouache. It just feels like your pile of mix is just gone. Yeah, it's gone all of a sudden. You do two brush strokes and it's gone. <laughs> it feels like I'm forever mixing and trying to color match what I've already done. <laughs> and it's always a challenge. But actually it teaches you a lot when you do that. Like when I have to constantly mix the same colors or similar colors as much as I can, um, every time I, I do that, it teaches me so much about color. So I can't complain. Um, maybe a slightly more white with this background trunk, this background root, I mean. It doesn't matter too much if each mix is not exact. It's because there's going to be so much variety on top of this. There's going to be a lot of moss and a lot of shadow and light bouncing around. And I just need to start with a dark base because once you start getting white in there and start playing with all those layers, it's really hard to go back to the dark darks, I find, on tree trunks, that is. I think it's, uh, I, over the years, I've just learned it's better to start with the deeper shadowy tones on the bark. You can dry brush it on a little bit, but I think this is just a more straightforward approach. Now we need to let this dry completely. Okay, I took a little snack break, let it dry. And now it's, little, it's good to do that because then I see everything with fresh eyes and I can, I don't know, see things I was missing before. Now it's time to layer on my bark textures. I think I'll stick with my flat brush. So what I'm going to do is mix up some This is gonna be my shadow color. So everything on top of this becomes how I define the shapes and the, bark textures and the mosses. So if I want some moss, it's gonna dry lighter, I mean darker because everything I do now is almost going to blend with what I put down. But 
but I want to first help myself to find this edge of the tree that's in the foreground so I don't lose it. It's kind of nice that the paint if I lo 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 words, if I load it on the brush thick, it starts blending with what's below it. So I can actually let some areas fade off. I can keep other areas more intense really easily. And try to create that variety that I need because if I want this moss to be realistic, I, I can't just paint it solid. It'll be a combination of transparent and opaque spots as well as dry brush. Dry brush is just wonderful for bark and trees and mosses and such. I'm basically going to go from left to right, so I'm going to do this whole trunk first, I think. And then the, the reason that's good is because I can test out my ideas on this side. So I have my concept sketch. Um, the main thing I liked about this is the brighter greens on the left side and that kind of that rim light here and some of the blues in the shadows, which I kind of already knew would happen. Like that's, that's my typical strategy. Um, but now that I have my darker undertone, it'll be like way, way easier to achieve that. Um, but I do... I'm going to go slow so that I don't cover something accidentally. I need to leave room for shadows and I'll also squint at this point to kind of see if my eye is able to understand the edges. Um, let's add a bit of viridian into the mix. Some spots. It's a nice, like, shadowy, mossy color. I need to also add um, browns because there are browns. Can't just totally ignore that. If you've been watching me for a long time, you probably know I love purple and green on my trees. <laughs> just that's where my mind goes. I'm trying to mute down every green I use with at least a little bit of red, or in this case, the magenta. So it's not just pure color straight out of the tube. Let's make this a, a knot that has like an opening. I would love to know if anyone else is working on something or if you're painting while I'm painting, what are you working on? It'd be really great if we could all just paint together in the same room. Are there painting conventions? <laughs> like that, not necessarily based on teaching, but like painting conventions where you just go and paint with people. That must exist. Is that a little too red? Let's try. Let's try and see. It's how it roll. How I roll. I, it's always 
what I'm doing. I'm trying it and I'm seeing. Especially because you have to wait for it to dry or at least sink in a little bit for it to really to, to see the actual color and the actual value. It takes a split second. You can't just do it and instantly know it's correct. So it's a slow process, but I like that. I think this is therapeutic in a way. It's tiring mentally, but just being aware of the magic that's happening is, it's like you're making something appear on a piece of flat paper. It's how, that's magic. It's fascinating to me. couple spots of pink that I'm gonna drop in there which are going to make the mosses around it feel more intense. I'm gonna leave that um, overhanging section here like this, oopsie, actually, does that work? I don't know, maybe it works. Let's try a little lighter. I'm gonna leave a little more purple showing through here though, because I want it to feel like, you know, it's that part has a lot of shadow. There's gonna be a little more light here because the sun is kind of coming from that direction. So I can use more light green, maybe. Not too intense because I want it to feel like it's behind. I think that works though. Like if I layer a bit of darker green and then come on top with like a whiter sat desaturated green. Oh, but I never finished this. So let's do that. I'm doing the thing where I, the thing I always do, which is jumping around. Um, also, I apologize if you can hear weird computer sounds. My computer randomly, like, makes noises. <laughs> I don't know if it's something loading or updating. It'll just suddenly, like, wake up and do things. And the microphone is kind of close to the computer, so... All right, that's okay for now. I'm just gonna let it dry and kind of see how it works with the rest of the tree because it's all gotta be relative. <laughs> this is tricky though. I'm realizing like, usually I don't paint quite as much moss on a tree. I let it, maybe the moss stays near the bottom This time I'm really loading it up. I think it's so good to have pieces that are a departure from your normal strategy or normal colors. And even if you never even complete it to the extent where you're like happy with it and it, hang it up on a wall, that kind of thing. like. Just having it mostly done, at least, in your collection, you can always look back on it and kind of see that growth or see that moment of learning. Like, this will be a record of everything I learned today, and as long as I don't rage quit, 
I won't rage quit, don't worry. But yeah, just having pieces like this that to me, this is very different than what I normally do. I don't usually use this color combination and I don't always use this layering approach. So trying it, first of all, it's going to teach me a lot. And having this in my stack of finished paintings and yeah, just repeating myself now, but it's really good. Oh man, <laughs> like a month ago, I posted a video on Instagram. Basically, it was me showing what I do with old paintings. And at the beginning of the video, I'm like, hey, people ask me what I do with my stacks of paintings because I paint a lot. I have a lot of paintings just lying around. And so I show myself with a huge stack of paintings and then I show putting them in a nice archival box and I explain how I keep some in an archival box to protect them and I just, yeah, have those stacked up on my shelf. And then the next scene cuts to me outside by the recycling bin and I'm like, but I have a lot of paintings and I'm not very sentimental. <laughs> and then I just dump a huge stack of paintings in the recycling bin. And I think the I Will Remember You song is playing in the background and whatever. People went nuts in the comments. <laughs> so many people. Oh my god, I can't believe you just did that. Ah. But the it's so funny to me because I've been doing that for years. I paint hundreds of paintings every year and some I keep. Yes, I have a ton of paintings that I've kept over the years. But a lot of them are like half finished or paintings that have like a streak across because I dropped my brush and it's just messed up and I'll paint on the back. I'll do swatches on some of them and I'll keep them around for a while until they just are way too, there's way too big of a stack. And then I purge and I recycle a ton. And it was just, I don't know, it was a, I guess it shocked people. And I was laughing so much like I explained how I, I do use the backs of paintings to do sketches on or swatches, whatever. And I also will give some away. I give some away to friends and family. Um, but I just end up with hundreds of extra paintings every, every year. And eventually, sometimes I use them for fires, like I, fire starters. But eventually I just need to get rid of them. So anyway, that was the drama Wow, okay, I need to pay attention to what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, suddenly I started shifting into auto mode, autopilot. Too dark, too light? We'll see. We'll see how that dries. Um, but up here we have... On the shadow side over here, I think I'm going to shift it towards the cooler green again. And then maybe come back on top of it with a light blue. Actually, I do need a bit of brown on this side. It's not totally mossy. These little tiny micro decisions over and over. Like, I wonder how many I do in a single painting. Probably a thousand, maybe more. <laughs> That's what's exhausting about it. It's like relaxing on one hand and so fascinating and so enjoyable and like at times very therapeutic. But then, wow, by the end of a painting session, especially if I've done the value studies, then a color concept study, then a final study, like my brain is totally fried. I'm no, I'm not the only one. I've, I've heard other people talking about this and... It is common. It feels exactly like it felt in college when I was studying art history or whatever the topic was. Like it's that intense, tired brain feeling. <laughs> but it's rewarding. At least, you know, after I'm done, the next day or whatever I wake up, I know that I learned a ton and I can apply it to whatever I'm doing the next day. I love that feeling. 
Okay. This one is a lot more brown, but I do need moss on it. So now I kind of like the strategy though, like starting with that dark purple, grayish purple, and then adding a bit of that bark color. And now I can come back with my moss. and try not to destroy it. <laughs> try to keep it consistent. Maybe a bit more yellowish green. It's a constant back and forth with gouache because you know, the tiniest amount of color changes it pretty drastically. I feel like I'm always remixing and, you know, you touch a tiny bit and then you try it out and you're like, oh, no, nope, needs more yellow. And then you do it again and again. It's over and over. But that's why I love having a huge pile of grays like this. Like I can grab bits and pieces of each color or tone as I need it rather than having to start over every time. I think, and also, you know, if I'm mixing a dark green, next to a light green, I can see those in comparison. And I know when I touch that to the painting, it's going to be a lot lighter. So. I think that's working okay. I don't want to lose the interesting bark textures. Like there's a lot of streakiness and not streakiness, wait. There's vertical bark. So that there's a lot of vertical like striations in the bark itself and I can kind of draw that in with the moss here and there. Um, I think I need a bit more shadow here. Okay, so now I'm trying to think of, as I complete this trunk, I'm trying to think of the bottom, the roots, how these need to go down into the leaves and all of the stuff happening on the forest floor. I still haven't done the shadow, so we need to do that. And have some kind of it needs to hold on words uh, I need to make this look like it's not floating that's what I was trying to say <laughs> uh, and that'll start to happen once I paint my leaves and but I think because I want my leaves to be covering parts of the roots I need to paint those roots first we'll try that I'll paint the roots hints of these like there's all sorts of little spindly roots at the bottom. And then I can come back with the shadowy leaves and the brighter leaves on top. And hopefully it'll make sense. <laughs> I could always add more roots and stuff at the base later. Let's try this for now. Okay, for the leaves, I think I'm going to use my bigger flat brush because I like to mess up the hairs and like dab it like that for the leaves. Kind of a dry brush thing. So, but now I need to be really careful with my color mixing. So I want reddish tones, brownish tones, and... 
Actually, first let's do the shadowy leaves. are like a I need them to be like deep bluish purple I think because that's gonna stand out against whatever I do on top so at the base of the tree I think will be the darkest shadows it's like All these little places where beasties live. It's one thing I get a little freaked out. Like I love walking up to a big old tree and hugging it and sitting at the base of the tree. And then I look up and there's a massive hole with huge spider webs. And I'm like, oh, right. This is someone's home. Something's home. <laughs> My bad. I'm just trying to go slow so I don't completely ruin my progress. But if, as I paint over some of these roots, I'm starting to see where I can use a bit of warmth and highlights on the leaves that have fallen. I'm just going to kind of have it fade off into the background. I'm not going to do anything else to the background. I'm going to leave it just so I have that reference. So I know like how this, how it feels to have a really soft flowy background than all this gouache, which is clearly gouache. <laughs> <laughs> on top of that and typically I would go back into the background and add more definition and like really play with the layering up back there but not this time can start shifting to a bit more reddish, warm. I may also come back in and paint like some fallen branches and things, maybe some sticks with moss on them here and there. Well, will I? I don't know. Need more. In the highlighted areas, I want to have a bit of warmth on these leaves. And then I'll even come back on top of this with some brighter, sandy, yellowy. Oh, I just looked outside and it's a beautiful sunny day, but I was out earlier and oh my goodness, it is deceivingly cold. I woke up and it was negative three C. I was like, okay. And it was very icy. It had snowed yesterday, but everything turned to ice. And wow, it was, it felt like negative 10 or something. It was so frigid. Uh, but I went out for a walk with Fleeky, my cat Floki and I, we always go for a walk. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it was so sunny and beautiful. I was like, oh, cool. I can paint outside. I'll just bundle up and get everything, you know, get a hot water bottle and get really warm and find somewhere nice to sit in the sun. And when I got back from my walk, I was like, nope, not going to happen. Today is an indoor painting day. And 
it's okay. It happens. If I'm painting outside, I don't get to do things like this where I spend so long focusing on detail. It's a just different type of study session. As much as I would rather be outside painting because of, yeah, being in nature to me is much more enjoyable than inside. I, uh, this is very important for learning. Okay. I think that's pretty good. I need to maybe fill in some of the lighter areas here. This doesn't make sense that it's so light on the forest floor there. Having that pale color show through from the first wash is helping here, especially because it feels it's like that dim light coming through and just catching the edge of those leaves and stuff. So this side though, could use a little bit more variety and maybe just a hint of that color back here to round it out. I don't want to go too far back, too detailed back there. Okay, so now some of these roots in the foreground, they're kind of lost so I can actually come back in and maybe catch the edge with some light, like this one. See if it's light enough. It might need it might need a little burst of light. Just adding white and yellow to the green so that it really stands out. Um, maybe just a hint of rim light on this guy. I'm trying to squint my eyes so it, it like really simplifies everything. I love playing with uh, like beams of light coming through. So maybe a beam of light came through and just caught this edge, this edge, and this edge. It's just a hint of dry brush. It's all you need to tell that story. I think there would be a little more light here bouncing around. Don't know what I did. I didn't like finish this part. A lot of it is just waiting until you're closer to the end to see where you need to put a little more focus because yeah, some things don't become obvious till the very end, at least to me. Like I, now I can see little bits and pieces that need a bit more green or a bit more attention. Well, I hope you have enjoyed hanging out with me in the sketch session. I'm almost done, so I think one thing I like to do a lot is get some really light blue. Usually ultramarine or something with some white. And I'll do just hints of it on the shadow side. Um, on areas that I think would be reflecting the daylight. So not the whole thing. And that actually may be too colorful, but just a hint here and there. When I use a really light touch, I can just graze that uh, 
color on top, glaze. I graze the paper and I glaze the color on. <laughs> and that's a fun way to play with light bouncing around. Okay, so the fun part about the challenge of this painting was to not go black with the darkest darks. Like, didn't want to go ultra, ultra dark. If I, if I compare the darkest parts of this painting to my black brush, my darks are here are lighter and more colorful, which is always something I'm trying to push. But, but it is always tempting. <laughs> I'm so tempted now, right now in this moment, to go in and really darken some of those, some of those deeper cracks in the, in the, especially down here in the roots. But if I do that, it will really change the values, like everything that's I've already established. And then I'd have to rework some areas and it's like, I don't know, I kind of like having this fun purple color as the sh darker dark. And it's all relative, right? So if this is my darkest dark, I have to work with that. I have to treat it as the dark. And then everything else is lightened from there. Uh, okay. But I think I'm going to stop touching it now because I keep wanting to do more. Wait, one more. That's what I'll keep saying. One more. Just a couple more lines. Although I do really, lately I've been more and more into combining almost like a drawing technique with painting. So maybe here and there there's some more obvious lines drawn in. It gives it more of an illustrative look, to, in my opinion, which I love. Maybe I should just do a few paintings that's, that's, I emphasize that technique, you know, like really focus, really bring in some of those drawn elements with the paint. It could be fun. All right. Uh, in my value study, I included some branches that were sort of hanging down. So maybe that's something I will do at the now that I'm pretty much at the end. It's like this kind of feeling at the end where it's like, am I about to mess everything up? I'm not. This is important, having these little squiggly branches hanging down like that. That was a big part of this tree. If I don't include it, it'll feel more sparse than I want it to. But I just want them to feel like they're kind of leaning away, so I'll Add a bit of white to the mixes, which gives it kind of a, it distances it slightly, desaturating it with white rather than keeping it the same as this. It's not too different. I'm just going to stop talking now. <laughs> you know, that whole painting while talking thing, I don't know if it'll ever get easier. I do live paint alongs for my patrons sometimes and I'm always like, well, I feel like I'm stumbling over my words half the time. Do I want to do one over there or is that going to be too distracting? I will do, I will not do one over there. Just like fading them off 
with a dry brush. It's like, you know, it's, it's happening back there. <laughs> it's like hinting at it. Okay, now let's do a tape peel. If I haven't done something and I want to do it, it's too late. It's over. <laughs> I hope this doesn't tear. It's still a little wet. Oh no, we're good. Always make sure the paper's dry. I never really have issues with my uh, bao hung paper, with, especially with the Hanamula tape. It's, I don't know what it is, that combo just works so well. Maybe because it's quite textured. I didn't press this tape down too hard. There were, there's a couple spots that it kind of seeped through a little bit, but um, yeah. Oops. Hope you guys enjoyed hanging out with me. Okay, here we go. This is the final piece. I had a lot of fun with this one. I had fun playing with the value studies and these new color combinations are always tricky, but like I said, I learned so much and now I'm excited to play with it even more, see what else I can do. I do like this combo for uh, painting greens. It's very, there's such a variety. Obviously with the Viridian, you can stretch it to more of a phthalo green, but then you can easily mute it down. So that's fun. And since I wasn't using lemon yellow, I wasn't worried about creating everything too <laughs> vibrant. The permanent yellow deep, which is more of an orangey yellow, definitely helped with that. There we go. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I will see you all next time. Happy painting.